Let's give it for the band one more time for leading us in worship today. My name is Titus Bourne. I'm part of the student team here. And today we want to celebrate what's been going on on Wednesday nights. And I just want to say how cool is it to watch students come up here and proclaim the name of Jesus and then worship the way they do down here. Can we give it up for them? Yeah. Seeing their faith. I mean, I just know that I feel so privileged just to watch the students grow in their faith and lead out um, in ministry on Wednesday nights and every single week. And today I'm going to highlight some things that are going on in student ministry on Wednesday nights. And we're here to give you a little, just a flavor of Fuse. You know, we have students come out every single Wednesday night and share a, a verse on their heart or something that God's doing in their lives. So we want to be a student-led ministry. And so to see students step up to that plate is just just amazing to see. So before I uh, get any further, I just want to say thank you to Pastors Tim and Carrie Bourne, mom and dad. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. You know, I've, I've grown up my whole life uh, in this church. And I remember when we started the church out of our home when I was just a wee lad. Uh, and we bounced around from our house to Pink Elementary to Bulls Elementary to the building we were in over on 9750 John W. Elliott behind a field house. You know, there's a journey. There's a journey of, that our family went through, you know, to get to where we are. And I'm going to talk more about that later on today. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you, growing up to PK, watching my parents, you know, ministry, I know sometimes, you know, it can seem like we're like the perfect little family, you know, but, you know, there's a lot of storms that you go through as a family in ministry. And as a pastor's kid, the storms that I went through. And I think today, as we go through this story, talking about storms that we experience in our lives, I want to ask you, do you have any storms you can remember in your life or storms that you're going through right now that have affected you in any kind of way? And something I was thinking about, something that I know I've learned is that storms often reveal what you truly rely on. Storms, they, they, they make you find out something about yourself, right? You find out who's there for you, you find out what you turn to, and storms have a way of telling the truth about how we live our lives. And today, as I go through the Bible story, there are three mindsets I think we fall into um, when it comes to storms that kind of take us away from God instead of push us towards God. And as we go through today, uh, it's going to be a challenging message, um, but I hope that you can walk away knowing that there's purpose behind everything Jesus does, and he has a purpose for your lives. Does that sound good? Ready to get into it? Okay, let's go. Luke 8, 22, it says, One day Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and said to them, Let's go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out. Jesus sets a course to the other side. Now, to give you guys context around this story, it's very important to look at the context when reading our Bibles. This is the Sea of Galilee that they're crossing. The Sea of Galilee is known for its horrendous storms, for hurricane-like, you know, boat-wrecking storms. And the disciples are fishermen, so they have experience. They know what seas to fish on, what seas not to fish on. Like, they know what's going on. These guys are professionals, okay? Like, if we got Peter versus Pastor Tim on a boat, you know, most bass win. Like, who's going to, I don't know, you know? I want to see it, though. I want to see it. But these are, these are seasoned fishermen. They know what this sea is. They know, you know, what this place is, what it means, what it's known for. And so now, you know, the disciples are in a situation in which they're probably looking at Jesus like, are you sure? Are you sure? Like, has anybody ever given you, like, wrong directions before? And you're like, I know. I know it's a left turn right here. I, and they're like, it's right. It's right. Or like the GPS says, go left, you know. And that person is, like, so stubborn that they know better than the GPS Come on. Outside of DFW, I don't know how to get somewhere, okay? But I think about that scene from The Office where Michael is driving and it tells him to drive into the lake. And Dwight's like, don't do it, there's a lake there. And sure enough, he goes right into the lake, you know? I think the disciples are faced with this moment of like, Jesus, like, this is, like, do you understand, Jesus? Like, do you know what this is, you know? And, and to give even more context, I was reading about the Sea of Galilee, in some research, and I, I found out that there's three different winds that come on to the sea that cause these storms. There's the south wind, there's the west wind, and there's the east wind. And the east wind causes the worst kind of storms. It's the strongest uh, uh, wind that comes through the sea that, that, that creates the, the strongest storm they could possibly face. And so guess what wind they are sailing into on this, on this day? The east. They're sailing right into the east wind on the, on the one sea that's known for its storms. So 
Y'all see the picture, right? You set it up, right? They, they understand what they're getting themselves into, and Jesus is saying, let's go. Now, props to them for saying, you know what? I, okay, I trust you, Jesus. You know, I trust you. So here they are on this sea. And it says in the next verses, and as they, as they sailed, he fell asleep. Jesus fell asleep, taking a little nap, a little siesta for Jesus. Now a violent windstorm came down on the lake. So here it is, it's happening. The boat started filling up with water and they were in danger. They came and woke him saying, master, master, we are about to die. So the very thing that they all have known, this is a part of this sea, it's happening. It's finally happening. They're running down to Jesus saying, we're about to die, we're about to die. They freak out, right? freak out level 10. Now, I don't know if you know anybody who's like a freaker outer, you know? to like the, the top level, right? Like 100% reaction rate kind of thing, right? My mother <laughs> suffers from this. And my, my whole life, and I, she's a very sweet lady, but she just, in a, in a household with three boys, right? The level, the amount of times we have scared her, played a prank on her, it has never failed to get the same reaction. Like, <laughs> To an extent, you'd think it would kind of build up a level of like tolerance. No, she just never thinks we would do it to her, which is so sweet that every time we do, it always gets the reaction we want, okay? So I have a very stark, like stands out story um, of an example of this. Uh, there was a time uh, back when I was about five years old, uh, we had this huge storm roll through Frisco and I was homeschooled for preschool. So we were playing shoots and ladders at the time. Um, my little brother Silas was just born. He was sleeping on the couch. Me and mom are playing shoots and ladders. And all of a sudden three things happened, okay? Three things happened to me. The first one, my ears start ringing. And I'm talking like someone just like claps really loudly or like a going off by my ear. Like everybody had that feeling of like, it is ringing, ringing, can't hear anything else, right? Second thing that happened, everything went white. And to five-year-old Titus, I am dead, is what I was thinking at the time. This is it. This is what death is. I've heard about Jesus. I'm going to go meet him now. It's been, a good, it's been a good time, you know? Shoots and ladders. That's what I was doing when I went out, you know? Um, so I can't hear anything. I can't see anything. And now the last thing that happens is you ever felt that feeling of like when you lean back in the chair and like, it like kind of catches, and like you kind of catch yourself, come back down. So I felt that feeling, that little, but I, I never came back up, all right? I was just falling. Like the, the feeling of catching it never came, so I just, I, was, I, I felt myself falling. So in a, in a moment, I was, I was blind, deaf, and falling to the ground, okay? And I'll tell you what was happening as this was all taking place is that a lightning bolt had struck our house, okay? And I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. You probably try to stay away from lightning bolts as much as you can. But it sounds like a shotgun. Like it is the loudest thing I think I've ever heard happen. And, you know, the white takes over. But the lightning bolt, you know, it can do a lot of things, but it can't like come inside and like take and like throw me on the ground, like push me on the ground. You know, lightning bolt can't do that. So how am I falling? This is where my mom comes in. Okay. My mother, in a moment of panic, okay, frantic, she goes to grab me and like, you know, run. I don't know where we're gonna run to, okay? <laughs> Away. Run, and instead of grabbing me, she grabs the chair, okay? And she just, I mean, full force, okay? Yanks me, okay? Yanks the chair that she thinks is me. Yanks the chair, and all of a sudden, I'm on the ground, right? I'm dazed and confused. She's holding a chair in her hand, and Silas, the little baby, is still asleep on the couch, all right? <laughs> Like, what is happening? The chaos moment, I'll never forget it, but it was a moment where we didn't know what was going on. The storm was getting crazy out there. Now it was hit our house and all these things. It's, it's chaos, right? It's chaos taking place in our house. And I think about that story, and I think sometimes our lives look like this. Like a storm is going on all around us and chaos is taking place. We are living in this state of frantic and in panic and in chaos uh, that we can't quite describe. And I think what we uh, need to know and need to be aware of is that no matter who we are, 
what we have achieved, how high you've gotten up the corporate ladder, what house you live in, what car you drive, all the things that we could possibly attain in this life. No matter what you've done, who you are, where you're at, we will all face storms. At some point, the storm comes for us all. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That we will all, there will always be a storm that we will face in our lives. And I think some storms that we go through, and, I'm, I'm not, and today I'm going to talk about these storms. I don't want it to, to seem like I, I, I am disqualifying the storm that you have gone through or, or can understand what it's made you to feel. I'm not here to pretend to understand how the storm has affected you, but I am here to help you kind of see the perspective in the storm and find some peace in the storm. But some storms I think we have, we have faced maybe in this room, some storms in this room is, is losing a loved one, right? Losing, losing a loved one, maybe losing a child. Maybe... Maybe on the verge of divorce. Maybe that the papers have been exchanged or are thinking about being written on. Maybe downsizing took place and now you lost your job and you don't know if you're gonna get another one in the same field, if you're gonna switch career paths. Maybe a financial crisis has left your family in a hole that you have not been able to get out of since the pandemic. You know, there's all these storms that we face and I may not have hit yours, but when I say the storms that you face in life, I'm sure you think of something. I'm sure you can think of a storm that you've went through, that your family has gone through, they're going through right now. And within those storms, there's three mindsets we fall into. The first one I think we fall into is saying that I can handle it on my own. I can handle it on my own. I am strong enough, I'm smart enough. You don't know the degree I have, Titus. You don't know how much I've, I've been able to figure out on my own, Titus. I can handle it on my own. And I'm not trying to take away from your education or your ability, or maybe even your brute strength. But I do know the same way we will all face storms is the same way we will all face a storm that we can't handle. Meaning, you may have been able to figure out some storms in the past, but it doesn't mean there's not a storm coming that one day you're not gonna be able to handle on your own. That there's a, there's a storm that comes for all of us at some point, and it's a storm that is too much for us. And the waters start to come over the side of the boat, the winds are whipping, and we are in a, in a mode and in a mindset of we are about to die. But even in that, some of us still say, I can handle it on my own. You're on the verge of losing it all. You're on the verge of losing everything, and yet still you say, I can handle it on my own. And I think the problem with that in this story and how it doesn't line up with the Bible is that these are seasoned fishermen. Like they, in this, they have been in storms before. They know how to navigate the waters, and yet what is their reaction? The experts running to Jesus. And if the experts in this field have to run to Jesus for help, then why do we think we can do it on our own? We have to be willing to say, I need Jesus. It's a very simple statement, I need Jesus. I know in moments in my life where I start thinking about how I can get it all done, how am I gonna fit all this into my schedule, how am I gonna do all these things, achieve all these things, I start telling myself that it's on me. I start thinking that I have to figure it all out. How quick are we to start thinking that it's on us to solve, on us to fix? And we have to admit, even in those moments, I know I'm, I suffer from this as well, I get it. But I have to be willing to say, I need Jesus. I can't do all of this. I need someone stronger. I need something that is eternal, something that is bigger than myself. And I wanna say that asking for help, I think a lot of the time it is deemed as being weak. And I think to my men in the room, you've been told if you ask for help, that you are a weak person. And I think I wanna, I wanna combat that today. And I wanna say that asking for help is not weakness. Asking for help is being human. That we have gotten to a point sometimes where we think that if I ask for any aid or any help for something, I am therefore admitting that I am not strong enough. But the point of faith is admitting I'm not strong enough 
because I need Jesus' strength to be able to get through what these storms are. I don't want to rely on my strength. I don't want to find out how much I can carry. I want to, to, to rely on God who I know can carry more than I could ever imagine. So why find out my limit where I can lean on the God who is limitless? That's what we have to approach it as. It's okay to admit help. Dependence on God is what we are made to do. Now, I'm not saying we don't need strong men to lead well in their households and in the church, but that strength cannot come from you. That strength has to come from God. And that allows you to become the husband, the father, the boss, the coworker, the son that you were meant to be. Not who you've tried to, to, to make, you know, measure up to all the comparisons, but no, no, becoming the purpose man of God. It's not about trying to fix the storm. It's about believing that we have a God that can fix the storm. So, the first mindset of I can handle it on my own brings us to the next verse. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. Jesus, again, sleeping. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we are perishing, God? God, do you not care that my finances are falling apart? God, do you not care that we haven't had an a, a, a argumentless night in our marriage and days? Do you not care that our kid is continuing to get in trouble over? God, do you not care? I just lost that person. I just lost that job. God, do you not care? See, the disciples turn to Jesus here. But their, their, their words say, God, do you not care that we are perishing? Do we ever turn to Jesus? Yes, but do we turn to him for the wrong reasons? Do we turn to Jesus to be angry at, to be bitter at, to yell at, to scold, instead of to invite in? And I think that the, the mindset we fall into, the second mindset that we fall into in these storms is we say, God, if you love me so much, why am I going through this? God, if you love me so much, why do I have to face any storms in the first place? And, and to, to, to kind of answer that question, I, I want to bring in other examples in life and then come back to this. So if we think about school, okay, think about school. School, for some of you, might have been a long time ago, may have been a short time ago. It's okay. There's no judgment here. You're not ageist in here, okay? Uh, you know, school back in the day, um, and it might have changed over the years. I'm, I'm very sure it has. Um, you know, they, they test you. They test you to, to see how much you know. And what did everybody hate in school? Pop quizzes, okay? Because if you didn't know you had to study for something, you're not studying, right? Like, that's how I, I get it, okay? You want to know the expectation, and then you want to do the expectation, right? But in order to improve or, or find out what you know or grow in your knowledge, you had to be tested at school, right? If you want to go on, on the lifting route, you know, if you're lifting, if you're trying to get stronger, right, you have to test and grow your muscles. The only way to do that is to push them, right? It's to be, it's to be challenged. It's, to, it's to, to make it a difficult workout. The only way to, to rise in a company, right, to get promoted. If your job every day is easy, I don't know if that's going to lead to promotion, right? It's the hard work that leads to promotions, right? Nothing came easy just because you did what you were supposed to do. It came at a hard price because you were willing to go above and beyond. It cost you something, right? So in all areas of our lives, we can agree these are ways we grow, right? These are ways we get better. These are ways we improve. So why then in our faith do we want it differently? Why then in our faith do we say, okay, I know how it works over here, but in my faith, I want it to be easy and expect growth in my faith. If we don't face storms, difficult times, what opportunities are there to rely on God? If we are stronger with God, if he is our source of strength, then an opportunity to lean on him, man, I want some of that. I want an opportunity to lean on my God. I want an opportunity to find out how strong he is. 
and I want to grow in my, if I want to grow in my faith, I have to accept the fact that storms are coming, not because God is wrathful and wants to hurt and punish, but so that I can grow closer to him. And I believe in the purpose that he has for me, which is to grow closer with him and to grow my faith through the storms that I may face. And there's a, couple, there's a couple verses that I believe can hopefully encourage you today. In Romans 5.3, it says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. I will glory in my sufferings because I know what it produces. If your perspective can be on what the storms produce, instead of what the storms are taking away. I wonder how some of y'all's perspective can change today. John 16, I have told you these things so that in me, Jesus, in Jesus you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered this world. Jesus has already conquered the things that you are going through. He's already conquered the storm that you are facing. So I, I want to encourage you today that instead of, of saying, God, why? Take pride in the fact that you can say, if you are willing to, in, to, to invite Jesus into your storm and believe in him through it and trust in him through it and rely on him through it, be proud of that and have a faith that says, I have a faith that survived the storm, that my faith wasn't lost in the storm. It breaks my heart to watch people they, they go through their life, they experience a storm, and in the middle of their storm, right before Jesus is about to do something amazing, about to pull off a miracle, show them why it was all worth it, show them the purpose behind it, right before they get to that point, they lose their faith. They walk away. And as much as we celebrate new salvations and new believers, which I believe we always should and we will always strive to have, I think we should celebrate just as much the believer that has been sticking with it for years who has been showing up Sunday and Wednesday, serving during the week. Yes, 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 it is inspiring to watch new believers. But man, if I can look at someone and say, that's a man who has followed for 20 years, that's a couple through ups and downs, bad and good, they put God first and they've stuck with it and they've raised kids who fear and love God the way they do, that is what I wanna celebrate. That's the kind of legacy I want. That's the kind of life I wanna leave behind. A faith that survived the storm. Man, too many times, too many times do people walk away right before, right before. God is doing something in your life. You may not be able to see it right now. But if I told you it was preparation, would you be willing to go through it? to have a storm that's, to have a life that's storm proof and storm tested so that when the next storm comes, you can say, I know what this looks like. I've been here before and I've seen what God does. That no matter what storm comes now, I know, I know and believe that God can do it again. Wouldn't that bring so much more peace if you could have that approach every single time you face a storm? instead of every single time trying to put a Band-Aid, trying to figure out how much, you gotta get, how much you gotta pay over here or do over here or try to fix on your own, take the weight off your shoulders. Give it to God. Now, a third mindset I think we might fall into when we face these storms, and this is a tricky one, but I need to wait until the storm is over to experience peace. Now, what I mean by that is I think some of us we will get in a situation and become almost apathetic to the storm that is in our life to a point where we say, you know what, how much worse could it get? I feel like every bad night has started with that phrase. <laughs> right? How much worse can it get? You know, we're already here. You have that one friend who's kind of like a devious guy. He's like, look, we're already here. We might as well. <laughs> no, no. But I think when we get into storms that maybe we're familiar with or faced a lot of the time, or even just storms in general, 
we sometimes say and almost excuse our maybe sin behavior or excuse the storm around us to be, you know, just the, the product of my situation. Well, it's just, it's, just, it's just the card I've been dealt. I mean, the hands I've been dealt. It's just the way it is right now, Titus. It's just, it's just how it is. And we'd rather find out how much worse it can get before we turn. Let me go to the furthest, furthest degree of where this storm's gonna take me. Let me be all the way broken. Let me be all the way gone. Let me lose everything before I turn. Because we're unwilling to say, no, I need to find Jesus now. Before it gets to that point, I need to find Jesus now. Before it reaches where you lose your marriage, I need to find Jesus now. Before it reaches to a point where you lose your kid, reaches to a point where your student graduates high school without any foundation, I need to change now. There has to be an urgency that we have when we're in our storms to turn to Jesus. There has to be a certain amount of urgency because what happens in, in a lot of our lives is, okay, I'll fix it tomorrow. I want to fix it tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to get it done. Tomorrow comes. Oh, I got busy. You know, I can't fix it. Okay, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I got busy again. I got work. You know, we got a soccer team. We got a soccer practice. We got to do the things. I got busy. And slowly but surely, it's not getting better. You're only moving backwards. The problem is only growing. The storm is only brewing more until one day something happens that cannot be taken back. I'd hate for you to find out what that is and instead have an urgency today to turn to Jesus and to allow him into your situation. We get almost comfortable in our chaos. And to illustrate this, I wanna tell a story about my dad, okay, Pastor Tim. He sleeps, okay, with rainstorms, thunderstorms to like dial to like 11, okay? Like all the way up on the Alexa, the rainstorms are going on. Like we know if we hear it from, the be from their bedroom, like he's asleep, he's out, okay? And for a while, I probably said exactly what some of you are thinking right now. How could you do that, right? Like you would never be able to sleep through something like that. Like you have to have silence to sleep through it. And then I tried it, okay? Then I tried it. And I'll tell you, I felt like a baby. <laughs> there is something about like a consistent chaos that becomes comfortable. And I slept so well. And I thought, what a great illustration for us here, huh? We get so comfortable in our chaos that we just nuzzle right up to it. Oh, man, that, that chaos, that sin becomes so, so, so normalized. And we become so desensitized that we say, this is my home now. This is what I take rest in. And you're missing out on all the things God has for you on the other side because you have gotten so committed to your chaos and you haven't known a day without it in so long that you miss out on the peace that he offers. And I wanna ask you, how long has it been since you felt his peace? That it says in this next verse, Jesus' response to all this, to all of the chaos going around him and all the disciples, all, all their claims and screaming and, and yelling and freaking out, he says, peace be still to the wind and to the sea. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. So all of a sudden, after all this chaos erupting around them, Jesus steps in and he says, Whoo. silence, silence. And if I'm a disciple in that moment, I'm almost startled by that silence. I'm startled by how he can just get up and change everything. He can get up and say, peace be still and all is at rest. And I think what we have to learn from that, from this verse, from this story, is that peace is not the absence of problems. Peace is the presence of Jesus. That if we try to live our life, if we try to live our life trying to escape the problems, we will only run into more problems down the line. But instead of trying to escape, what if we decided to turn? Instead of trying to escape, what if we decided to invite Jesus into our situation? Because it's not the absence of the problems. There always be problems, but it's the consistency of the presence of Jesus in your life that makes a difference when the storm hits, when the storm that is too much for you, too much for your finances, too much for your family. When that storm hits, it is Jesus' presence that allows a way through, that silences the storms, calms our chaos, and brings peace to our problems. So then he asks, 
after the silence happens, he asks the disciples, where is your faith? But they were afraid and amazed, saying to one another, who then is this? Where is your faith? Wrestle with that question right now. Where is your faith? If I asked you where your faith was, and then I asked to look at how you lived your life, would it be different? Would you say, yes, I, I have faith in God, but then it really, you know, if we look at your life, it's I have faith in myself. I have faith in my job. I have faith in the money that comes in. Or are you wrestling with that question and realizing, maybe thinking that you lost your faith in the storm at some point? And it's been a while. It's been a while since you, since you knew what faith was. It's been a while since you felt that peace. Where is your faith today? Because the disciples' reaction when Jesus did this amazing thing, and our reaction should be the same, afraid and amazed, afraid and amazed. Now, growing up in church my whole life, I heard people say afraid of God or fear of God. And I was just like, I don't know what that means, you know? Like fear, like I should be like afraid of him like the boogeyman, you know? Afraid of him like, you know, Jack the Ripper? Like, I don't, you know, like, like how, like what does that mean to be like, the only thing I knew to be afraid of was things that were scary, right? And for me, it's clowns. I can't stand them. <laughs> I can't stand them. So I was like, I, was like, I gotta be afraid of God like that? And I was wrestling with this because it said it here in this verse, afraid and amazed. And I started thinking like, there's a healthy fear of God because of the power of God. Because it's so unfathomable, the power that he possesses, that it strikes a little bit of fear in us. It strikes a lot. It should strike fear in us. But the amazement comes from the fact that he has all that power and yet uses it for good and grace that he has all that power, all that strength, and yet on the cross, he was thinking of you. So yes, I have a fear, but I am in awe and amazed that we have a God that is so powerful and yet chooses to love us, chooses to help us, chooses to rescue us, chooses to challenge us out of love. How amazing a God like that. So finally, as I told you at the beginning, I was gonna tell you, reveal, why, why the storm? What is the purpose of this storm? Why do we go through these storms? Why are they going to the other side in this story? Jesus set a course. Titus, what is the point of all this chaos that we have talked about today? Well, let's read the next verse, Luke 8, 27. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. If you keep reading that story, he ends up transforming this man, rescuing him from his darkness. But there was a man on the other side of the shore that was lost in his sin, lost in his darkness, lost in his brokenness. And when Jesus stepped onto the scene, he saves the, man, he saves the man's life. What was the point of going through the storm? There was a why on the other side. There was a person on the other side, waiting to hear about the Jesus that can calm the storm, waiting to discover the hope that we have discovered, waiting to find the love that has been voided so much, waiting to be healed of the brokenness, waiting to find the light on all of their darkness. There is a why on the other side. We may think our storms are personal and only need to be solved for ourselves. What if I told you if you'd be willing to hold on, turn to Jesus, let him grow you, let him persevere severe you, let them push you, and then get through it, and then have that faith that says, I survived. You went through all that. I'll tell you right now, there's a person on the other side waiting to see your faith and say, that's a faith I need. There is a person on the other side. It's more than just you. It's for the next. You know, we talked about at the beginning, you know, Fuse and everything that's going on with the students, I'll tell you, they have grabbed a hold of this concept. They, they have gotten so passionate about reaching their friends, inviting them in to experience Jesus, that they have, they have fully committed to leaning on Jesus in the storms they face. In today's world, y'all, these teenagers, what they're going through, I'm telling you, it's different. It's a different level of dark. And now more than ever, do they need something like this? But they've gotten so passionate. I, I, I can say some stats real quick about what is going on in the next generation. 
In just 2024 alone, so we haven't finished a year yet, we're at 823 first-time guests. 10,000 plus, 10, plus check-ins of students this year so far. 150 plus decisions of salvation to give their soul to Christ. And then something we've been tracking recently is the Wednesday to Sunday connection. Over 40 families have now started coming to church, to this church, as a result of their student inviting them, going home and saying, look, I found something, you need it too. I want us to do this together. Students are leading, they are stepping up. How amazing is it that that is taking place? And maybe, maybe, maybe some of you are those families that have come as a result of your student. Can I just encourage you right now? Can I encourage you right now? They need a mom and a dad that are willing to put God first. They need a mom and a dad that when the storms come, they can watch them turn to Jesus. And I'll tell you, your kids are watching. They, all, they watch the way you worship. They watch the way you give. They watch the way you serve. They watch the way you prioritize. And I can tell you that because that's who I was. I was a kid who watched my parents go through storm after storm in this life. The ministry life is, it's, it's one that, is messy because people are messy. But I watched them love people that hurt them, love people that didn't deserve it. I watched people betray them. I watched people bash them. And yet through all of that, ups and downs, COVID decimating us, through all of it, they head on to the vision. They head on to the goal to reach more people on the other side. 3330, this building was the other side for so long. And now we're watching it on Sundays and Wednesdays over there in that building that the why to all we do is to reach more people. And I got to watch that as a kid. And that's what allowed me to build a faith to now stand here and preach and proclaim the name of Jesus. You don't think your kids are watching? They see it. They see it. And we need the next generation to understand the importance of light in this world. They are the next up. They are the next leaders. So today, if you're on the fence about turning to God, turning to Jesus in all these storms, I challenge you, don't just do it for yourself. Do it for the next person. Right now, we are, we are trying to knock down this wall that you see behind you, to expand this worship center to, to, to 500 more seats. And we're not just doing that to say we have the, the biggest numbers or the biggest crowd or anything like that. We do it because that's 500 more opportunities for people to hear the gospel. That right now we're averaging about 400 on Wednesday nights for students. Imagine that was 800. Imagine the next generation not just being reached with 400 at a time but 800 at a time. Imagine Sunday mornings not just being five, 600 but 1,200 at a time. It's not about the biggest number but it is about the most souls. And we want to reach the most souls as possible because of the why behind Behind that wall. There's a why behind everything we do, and I'll tell you, it will always be about Jesus. And if you don't believe me, if you, if you, if you stay, you know, if you're a skeptic in here that says, no, church hurt me too many times before, I, I don't know if I can commit to that again, I don't know if I can, you know, lean in again, I would challenge you, stick around and find out. Stick around and find out. We have to have people in today's world of all times in history to hold the line, to stay steady in their faith, and to reach more people. I don't know if you're in a storm today, but if you are, I pray that you turn to Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to learn more about you, God, to grow in our faith. God, I pray that any person, family, man, woman, going through a storm right now, God, that they can turn to you in this moment, that they can give you control. They can, they can, they can rely on your strength instead of their own. God, I know that the bitterness of asking, why God, why God, why God? God, I pray for that person. They can realize, that, God, that you are doing something in their life, that even though there's a storm, even though it's a mess, God, that you have a miracle waiting on the other side, that there is more at stake than just their lives, God, but the lives of others around them. I pray that they can stick to it. They can hold fast. They can, they can stay true to you, God, and they can rely on you through all of that. 
God, I pray that we live our lives in healthy fear and amazement of who you are and could be willing to admit that we as humans are flawed and finite and therefore in need and dependent on you. Lord, I pray for the family, maybe on the verge of something terrible. I pray for the man or woman, maybe on the verge of making a decision that's gonna wreck their lives or maybe they've been stuck in the same sin for so long. God, I pray that they would know they would just take urgency now, take action now and give it to you and let go of it, God, and allow your peace to fully take over their lives, God. It could be a different life from here on out. God, we are thankful for all you are doing. Thankful for all you're doing in the next generation, all you're gonna do going forward, Lord. We love you and we praise you in your name. Amen.